All right, well, thanks a lot for uh, being here with us. We're really excited to be here. And uh, I just wanted, I know you kind of heard some uh, interesting stuff about the, uh, the wheels, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. But I just have to share one really quick anecdote. Um, two weeks ago, I was at Masters Nationals, and uh, I did the uh, tandem time trial and tandem road race. And it was, uh, if you've ever been to Bend, Oregon, the, the time trial course is, uh, has an uphill and a downhill. And on a tandem at 48 miles an hour in aero bars, that's really scary. <laughs> and the road is not the best. And in the, uh, in the, in the ride, the time trial is actually on Wednesday. In the ride on Monday and Tuesday, uh, I rode just the regular wheels that I had, and uh, I was not convinced that I could ride down this hill at 48 miles an hour with 320 pounds of weight and control this tandem in the aero bars the entire time. The Tuesday before, I rode the, uh, the Zip 808 Firecrest tandem uh, wheels, and uh, the unbelievable thing of the bike becoming stable was just, un it was astonishing. The bike became incredibly stable, and I was able to ride literally at 48 miles an hour in the TT bars the whole time down this uh, down down the course. So just just that, and especially when you kind of think about a tandem, uh, the stability was incredible. What that relates to then is again, it made me more economical. I was able to be in those time trial bars and produce you know 340 watts downhill in the uh, in the tandem. Of course, my stoker helped too, so that was good. Anyhow, the, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the, the brief history of power training. I talked about this last year, um, and I uh, just wanted to kind of talk about um, how this is evolved and, and again, and, and how this relates to the things that we do as coaches, as athletes, as, uh, as consumers, as retailers, and then bring it together for you who are the dealers in the audience. What do you actually do when somebody comes into your, your shop and says, thinking about getting the fastest bike. What do I need to do? What do I need to get? Well, we'll talk about that in a second. These things have been around for a long time. 1896, 1913, uh, some crude power meter type things have been around helping us to understand that. The SRM came out in 87, the Look Power Max 1, 88. USA Cycling used the first SRMs in a state race in the Tour du Pont in 1994. Uh, power Tap became uh, you know, was born in 1998, 1997 as a tune hub, and Joe Frio wrote the first train with power manual back in then. We then had the uh, wise discussion forum began, so an online forum where we started to share ideas because we didn't know exactly what we were learning. Then uh, we had the first ever cycling power summit up in Philadelphia where Dr. Cog and Dr. Alan Lim and Dean Gollich all presented. Um, for me, I started with a power meter in, uh, when I started my coaching business in 96, and an athlete came to me and said, I've got a power meter, can you train me with one? I said, I guess so. And it was really clear right away that I had no idea what 300 watts meant, what 1,000 watts meant, what 20 watts meant. Is this good, is this bad, is this fast? I don't know. So I had to buy one, I had to go out and get one and start training with it again and have that personal connection, that personal relationship with it. And so for, for any time that we talk with, uh, you know, with dealers or with, with coaches, if they don't have one, they're not using one, then that's something that you're really missing out on. So I encourage all the dealers here, everybody in the audience, if you don't have a power meter or if, you're, or if your salesmen don't have a power meter, they really need one for themselves so that they can understand it for themselves and go forward. When we started to, to learn about this, then uh, we began uh, making Cycling Peak software, which is now turned into Training Peak software, and that's really the, the understanding of, of beginning to figure out what metrics are important. How do we present this data? How do I understand if I'm really improving over time? What is uh, my training stress? Can I handle more training stress this week? Can I, should I rest this week? Should I do more next month? Those are the kind of metrics that are really important that we, we start to develop. So training stress score, normalized power. The first thing that you learn when you go out on a power meter ride, my power's everywhere. 700 watts, 100 watts, 300 watts, 400 watts. How do I handle this? We came up with an algorithm, Dr. Cog came up with an algorithm called normalized power so that we could help to understand what the body feels like when we actually ride. So those things are, are really critical and have become standards in our industry in, uh, in analyzing this data and beginning to 
help the athlete understand how I go faster? How can I be more economical? Am I improving? Is this training actually really helping? Then, you know, uh, USA Cycling began power training based certification. This has been a huge thing for all of the coaches in USA Cycling. There are now 14, 1,500 coaches in USA Cycling that are, certif that are certified coaches. There's only about 200 or so that are power based certified coaches. So, again, kind of thinking about um, as a dealer out there in, in, in the world, how do I get more people in my shop? Well, I would encourage each of you to think about, can I align myself with a, a power certified coach in the area and get them to start doing presentations, get them to come in and be a part of your shop, be a part of your community, to bring those athletes to you so that then when somebody comes in, you have a knowledgeable expert locally that can talk really well about training with a power meter. What power meter should I get? What set of wheels should I get? Those are things that, that make a big difference at that local level. The first training of the power meter book was released. Uh, we did that in 2006, Dr. Coggin and I. We've done power seminars all over the world now. Uh, it's been a huge, you know, big uh, shift in, in the way a lot of us have all thought about this. Certainly the English speaking worlds have gotten that first. I'm doing a lot of work in South America now and opening those markets. And that's a big, big deal there too. So I think you'll see this continuing to go forward. 2009, Bella News listed the growth and development of Train of Power as the third most significant story of the decade. Number one was the internet. Okay, so uh, they they really thought this was important. So I was pretty psyched that we were number three behind the internet. I think uh, I'm not sure what number was, but anyway, Tour de France winners using power meters. I, I opened up. I'm a column, a columnist for the Road Magazine. Uh, I opened up the new Road Magazine. Make sure you get a copy up there. They usually have them free. Every, there was only two pictures actually out of the whole magazine that did not have a picture of a cyclist in there without a power meter. Every single picture except for two pictures had every athlete on a power meter. And I was like, wow, that is talk about penetration in the pro world. And that's one thing that we've really seen differently. We've seen this trickle up and trickle down. Like uh, when you think about car technology, Formula One, all that stuff comes down to us. But then what's happened in the power meter world, it's actually all of the, the local racers, the category fours, the, the fast touring cyclists, those people have bought power meters. Those were the early adopters. As their knowledge increased, it was really funny. These guys started to talk to the local pros and said, you need to get a power meter, you need to get a power meter. So all of a sudden the technology moved, trickled up to the pros, and then now all the pros are using them, and now everybody sees all the pros' pictures in the magazines, and now it's trickling back down to the people who are, haven't adopted yet. So it's very, been a very interesting flow dynamic of how this, is, how this has gone throughout the years. Here that, that kind of brings us to uh, you know, where we are now. And, and what is power? Because that's something that um, we all ask and we all wonder. And some, some basic definitions here so that you can take this home and, and think about it. Work is force times distance. Power is work divided by time. In terms of cycling, work is torqued by how much something twists, all right, multiplied by angular displacement, so how far that thing twists. Power is torque times angular velocity. Very simply, wattage is how hard you pedal multiplied by how fast you are pedaling. So I can produce 1,000 watts by pedaling really, really fast in a small gear, or I can produce 1,000 watts by pushing a very big gear very slowly, okay? so. You know, you hear after a bike race, why did I lose the race, or why'd you get second, why'd you get second? <laughs> well, everybody has all their excuses, but truly, why you got second? The guy in first, he pedaled harder, and he pedaled faster than you, okay? That's it, all right? Now, there's some economies that may have been happening there, all right, and that's what the, the Zip Talk was about, is how can we become more economical so that we don't have to pedal faster and harder than everybody to win the race? And that's really what we're talking about here. It's important because it's the direct determinant of performance velocity. It's measuring all the forces that are opposing you on the bicycle. If we can reduce the aerodynamic drag, if we can reduce the rolling resistance, if we can reduce all of these things, then it takes less power, less energy to go the same amount of speed. So that's really what we're measuring. When it says 300 watts, I can be riding on my beach cruiser at 300 watts at 18 miles an hour. 
happen. Okay, I'm sitting up, I'm hanging out. Now, as soon as I go into my Aero bike with my Aero Zip 808s on and everything is optimized, I'm doing the same 300 watts, but now I'm going 27, 28 miles an hour. I haven't changed my output, but just changed what is actually the forces that are resisting me and how I move through that space. Another reason this is important is because the direct determinant of physiological and perceptual responses. Power is what we call the dose. It is the training dose. It is what we're, you know, it's the water going into the bathtub. We can control how much water goes into the bathtub. The VO2, the heart rate, all these, the lactate in your blood, our perceived exertion, they respond to the dose. We've been thinking for a long time about training with a heart rate monitor. Well, that's really response, response training. Why did my heart rate go to 160? No, it went there because a dog chased me. No, it went there because I did a sprint. It went there because I almost got run over by a Mack truck. What are those things? Now we're training with the dose. When I say I want my athletes to do 300 watts at four times 10 minutes, they go out there and do 300 watts at four times 10 minutes. Disregardless or irregardless of heat, humidity, uphill, downhill, is still 300 watts. All right? So that's a huge deal. So when we use all of the software and training peaks, when we use this to analyze this data, it's very clear if we are improving or not. And that's really a, a critical component to understanding uh, the strengths and weaknesses of an athlete. Can I improve somebody from becoming, from uh, making a better, make them a better hill climber? Can I make them a better sprinter by training? How can I make that happen? So using that analysis, making those things are, are really key as well. So let's talk about selling this. So when it comes to um, right there in your shop, right there, wherever you are, what somebody walks in your off in your shop, they ask you about a power meter, what are you gonna tell them? Well, these are five really quick little things that you can tell them. More power equals more speed. Okay? So if you can generate more power, then you are going to go faster as long as you continue to improve your economy. All right? If you don't, you can't improve if you don't have an idea or a way to measure that, that improvement. Where am I now? I don't know. What do we do? How do we figure that out? We have to test you. We have to understand where you are. That's a critical part of it. We have to measure it. A huge thing is, is uh, I think a lot of our customers are all in the 35 to 55 range. They all have about eight to 10 hours a week to train. They have disposable income. They are the folks that are buying these products. They are the folks that don't have a lot of time. They don't have 20 hours a week to train. Optimizing your training time should be the, probably, this actually should be number one on the list. You can train more effectively with your time and go even faster, get there even quicker by using a power meter. It means, did my hard work actually help me? All right? How do you know? If you don't have a power meter and you go out and you do a, a 40K time trial, and the next year you go two minutes slower, and you didn't know if you actually produced more power, but heck, there was a huge headwind the whole time, you don't really know. You get disappointed about that. We can have that quantitative measurement of training with a power meter right there. And of course, it adds this new dimension to cycling. It, it takes cycling to another level. So for all the old school guys who've been out there for a long time, you know, they're riding their bike, all of a sudden they get a power meter, it's like something's new again. And this is a great thing to add to the fun and the excitement of cycling again. You know, it, it tells them, they come back and they download their power meter, they're spending time working with that. So again, Talk about these things to, to your potential customers when they come in. If they're looking for a, a $10,000 bike with the best zip wheels that they can have and the best SRAM components that they can buy, the next thing you should say is, well, you should have a power meter because this is, again, what's going to make you even faster all the way through. So um, Jordan, uh, come on up here for a second uh, and just share a little bit. Uh, Jordan and I were talking earlier and, and uh, about how he trains the power meter and uh, he just did Ironman Canada. Tell us a little bit about how you used your power meter for pacing and your functional threshold power. So a big part of, of triathlon training is a bit, I mean, it'd be a bit different than, than road racing or, or time trialing, uh, although it's not that different is that you do have to run after biking. And so one of the big things is that you want to make sure that you sort of don't spend all of your, you know, all of your money 
on the bike ride, right? You know, you hear it so often in a triathlon, I had a great bike, and how was your run? Well, I had to walk some of the marathon. And, and that happens all the time. And, you know, everybody says, well, it was a, you know, I don't do well with Gatorade, I think that was it. I say that, you know, you just, you paced it poorly. And generally, you know, I'm fond, I would say it is a more true statement to say that everyone in this room is exactly the same than to say that we're all different. You know, when you go in for knee surgery, your knees are in the same place as the other guy that the doctor is operated on. And that same sort of sameness is incredibly useful when it comes to racing and training. Basically, everybody, if you're sort of racing an Ironman, you can race it at roughly, you know, 75 to 80 percent of your functional threshold power. And you think, okay, that's that's five percent. That's huge. But I mean, when you actually, if you were to throw a power meter on everyone in a race and sort of look at what they ride at, I mean, it would be all over the map. And I think if you go in with a, a reasonable target, all of a sudden, you know, you have this this incredibly narrow range. And I mean, the more you ride, the tighter that number gets. I mean. I shoot for about 77 to 78%. I mean, you're talking there now about you know six watts different, uh, you know, from my sort of best race plan to worst. And that's the precision I can go in from from doing all this training with a power meter. And I also know that if I stick to that plan, I'm going to get off and I'm going to run well because I've I've done the training and I've approached the race with something that makes physiological sense. Right? You have a, a numerical, quantifiable <coughs> plan to approach a race with success. And I, there's so many different. And so I think just sort of pacing yourself in, what is Ironman pace? And it's, well, it's the pace that I'm comfortable for for six hours. But with a power meter, it's 77, you know, 75% of what you can do for, say, a 50-minute time trial. And I think that's a, it's a huge asset, right? It makes everything so much simpler. If you feel good on the day, you know, you can keep yourself in check. If you feel bad, you know, you have some confidence to say, you know what, I don't feel great, but I know that I can do this. I've done the training. You know, maybe I just didn't have a great night's sleep. And the other thing that's great is being able to sort of minimize this sort of variance. And you, I think people have a real inherent knowledge of this when they swim or they run. You know, you say to someone, uh, well, what was your average pace for the marathon? Well, I ran 730 miles. Well, how often did you run a five minute mile? Well, I didn't run any five minute miles. But when people ride their bike, you know, there's all these surges where they're averaging 250 watts. And then you see these chunks where, you know, they're three or four minutes at, you know, 400 watts. And then you think, well, what were you doing there? Well, I was getting up and over the hill. And you think, well, yeah, but when you walk that mile of the marathon, it was because you punched it up and over that hill way more than you should have. And that gets into the idea of normalized power, the difference between your average power, you know, a crit race at 200 watts is very different than just cruising around at 200 watts. And getting an understanding of that is really, I think, the second key to pacing a race well. So the first one is coming up with what is your reasonable target for an average power? And then the second one is learning how to minimize those spikes. You know, and that's true, you know, you look at bike racing where everything happens at the end, you don't want to sort of you know, again, spent all your money, burned all your matches in the beginning of the race is sort of smashing yourself up and over these hills when you could have been a little bit more conservative, you know, in a triathlon, making sure that you can run because, again, you haven't, you know, burned out your legs, even though your average power was fine. You know, you rode those hills so hard that you then had to coast, you know, the last 20 or 30 miles of the, of the bike ride because your legs are just so fried. And how do you think you're going to feel when you get off to run? So those are really my two things. Is one is how do I come up with a goal target power? And then how do I use my power meter to make sure that I'm pacing myself effectively so that that average power and that normalized power are as close as possible. All right, thank you. thanks Jordan. Okay, Jim. Very good. So now we're gonna switch a little bit to the power meters themselves. And so I'm Jim Meyer, I'm the founder of Quark Technology and I'm gonna throw up another slide here that you've kind of seen before. But again, this is, you know, what is power? Uh, and when you go to build a power meter, you need to measure some of these things. Uh, in our uh, case, we need to measure torque and RPM. And so just to do a little review on uh, how we do that stuff, uh, RPM measurement is done through several mechanisms. In our power meters, it's actually done with a reed switch and a magnet. And the reed switch is a little metal, or excuse me, a little glass tube, and it's got two metal reeds in it. And when it passes by the magnet, those touch together, and you can sense that. And so if you have a magnet and a reed switch, and a very accurate timer, you can count your RPMs, and I think we've all seen that before. Uh, you know, accelerometers are another new way to, to do uh, RPM measurement that we'll see more and more use of. But the harder thing is the torque. And so, uh, you know, how does a, a power meter actually measure torque? How, did, how, how is that measurement actually happening? Well, basically, it's a spring. Uh, and with any spring, it has a particular spring rate, and so if you compress this spring one inch, you know how much force it takes to do that. So if you put a 50 pound weight on it, it goes down an inch. You put a 100 pound weight on it, it goes down two inches. So you have this spring rate in there, 
uh, that it, if you measure the displacement of the spring, then you know how much force was applied to the spring. Because measuring force is kind of hard, but measuring displacement is easier. And so the way we measure displacement in a power meter is actually with strain gauges. And so strain gauges are a little uh, plastic strip that has a metal foil uh, grid overlaid on it that's etched onto it. And you glue this little piece of strap plastic down to, to, down to the aluminum or steel or whatever you're trying to measure. And when you stretch it, all the little wires get a little longer and a little thinner. And when you compress it, all the little wires get a little shorter and a little fatter. And short, fat wires have less resistance than long, skinny wires. And so the, when you look at the change in resistance, it happens very, very small. It's in parts per million. But if you measure that change in resistance over that gauge, then you have a, a measure of the displacement, how much the part moved. And then you, uh, if you know the spring rate, you can go from that displacement over to uh, how much uh, force was applied. And that's how we get from force or torque applied to the, uh, to the power meter back to an electrical signal that we can measure. And so this is a common technology of really all the major power meters right now. Uh, you know, Quark, PowerTap, SRM, uh, the new uh, pedal stuff is all using a strain gauge based technology. Some of them are using uh, different types of strain gauges, but this is really what uh, is at the core of all the popular power meters, meter systems today. So one of the tricks is that uh, the, uh, the spider of a crank set is actually not a simple spring, it's a complex shape. And so similar to the CFD uh, slides that they were showing you, in the power meter world we use FEA, which is finite element analysis, and that's a, uh, another computer modeling system uh, that allows us, you to model the stress flow through a part. And so that you can uh, fix a part with some, in some locations, apply loads at other locations, and then calculate how the part will respond at all the locations in between. And so uh, this is actually uh, can get very complicated and very expensive, but it turns out for power meters you can do it on a laptop, uh, which is pretty cool in about three or four minutes each time. So. Uh, makes it a little little simpler from, than, uh, than what these other guys are doing, but it does bring you into this whole burden of knowledge. You know, once you start to understand how the stress is flowing the, through the part, you have to decide, you know, what do you do with that? How do you actually build this into a device that you want to operate? And uh, here's a slide. This just shows a, uh, a strain gauge actually installed on a, on a power meter. So you can see they get glued on and then soldered up, or at least that's the way some people do it. We do it fancier ways, but we don't have photos of that. So, um, the, uh, at the, then uh, on the calibration, uh, we're going to just run back to like 8th grade uh, and the slope of a line when uh, the spring rate that we're, we're working with, we're working within the linear range of the spring. And so uh, when you go from the applied force to the electrical measurement out, uh, it's all linear. So y equals mx plus b. And so in calibrating a power meter, you really have two things uh, that you need to have calibrated correctly. One is this B, the zero offset, or how much uh, does electrical signal are you getting with no load attached. And so that's your zero offset. And then the other thing is the slope. Uh, and the slope is how the uh, electrical signal changes with the applied load. And so those are the two calibration bits uh, on, uh, that, that you need to have set for the uh, Quark power meters, they zero themselves uh, when you pedal backwards, that B is e very easy to measure, and you can uh, do that before every ride. Uh, the slope is pretty well baked into the power meter when we make it and doesn't change over time. But we do have ways of verifying it. Uh, you want to check your zero offset regularly, but if you need to check your slope, we do have a new iPhone application that's out now uh, that steps you through uh, in order to, to uh, verify that the slope is correct on your power meter. Uh, or if you need to recalibrate it for some reason. Uh, the key though is that you have to have a calibrated weight because uh, the power meter is very, very accurate. It's plus or minus 2%. And uh, you know, the regular dumbbell plates that you can get at the, at the gym are not 2%. They're way, way uh, more wide than that. They can really easily be plus or minus 5% on the weight. So if you're gonna calibrate your power meter, you really need to know that you've got an accurate weight. I'll run through uh, quickly here on some of the uh, development of the quark power meter and where the history of it came from and, uh, and the motivations behind it. Basically, I was racing triathlon in 2006, 
and went to buy a power meter and found that the SRMs were pretty expensive and you couldn't replace the battery on them uh, yourself. And then the, the power cap systems really limited your wheel choice. And I had some fancy wheels and didn't want to do that. And I thought, well, why isn't there a, uh, and both of them were all wires taped up and down your bike. And so I thought, why isn't there a wireless um, crank set based power meter that's more affordable than, uh, than uh, what the SRM systems were? And so I set off with that. That was in uh, February 2006. And of course, uh, just like I described, you got to measure the torque, you got to measure the RPM, you got to do a little math on it, transmit that data out, and uh, that's it. You know, that should be uh, pretty much the power meter. So I set to work on that, did some design work. This is uh, actually a photo of building and soldering up the strain gauges on the very first quark power meter, uh, which is back at home. And it looked like this. Uh, with all the off-the-shelf stuff on it. Um, it actually only took about three months to uh, put together the first prototype. Again, the strain gauges have been around for you know uh, numerous decades, and a lot of the other technology was pretty well off the shelf. And then there was a stroke of luck. It turned out there's a power meter calibration machine about a mile away from where I was living at the Queensland Academy of Sports. So I was able to go over there and uh, do some calibration and, and find out that the prototype was actually working. Um, and of course it worked, uh, and so yeah, way to, way to go, let's, let's, let's build it, let's start a company and build power meters. Uh, there, is, there is a problem in here, and, and that's that you build one thing that works once in one setting, it's very, very different from building a bunch of things that works for everyone all the time. And that's why from uh, the three months that it took to do the first power meter, it was actually another two years after that before the first uh, quark power meter shipped. Uh, that other two years was all in just the refinement, the water sealing, getting the production together, really pulling it together into a product. Uh, and that's really the, the kind of the complex story of the power meters and why they're very uh, costly now even yet. Um, you know, they're complex devices and once you, you know, for us, once we ship it out, uh, it really needs to keep working and we have a bunch of nerds out there using these things and they know when it's wrong and they tell us, you know. So, uh, so we really have to work very, very hard to get everything sealed up and working um, in a way that uh, people can use it in the field reliably day after day and without having to know anything about what's inside there. So, um, at the end of the day, we ended up, this is a Quark Cinco, this is the current model uh, unit. Uh, it's got a user replaceable battery, about 1800 bucks, uh, made it our, in South Dakota. And then of course, our, our new thing, uh, just announced now, we have a new mountain bike system. Uh, it's very, very similar to the road system. Again, the user replaceable battery, it's uh, all for the SRAM 2x10 drivetrains, and these are going to be available uh, in October, so uh, just another month away. I'm uh, starting up production on them now. So we're pretty excited about that, uh, to be able to have power on the mountain bikes also. So the final thing here, I had a lot of slides, and I was just, oh, I hated to throw things out, but we really wanted to talk about aerodynamic testing with a power meter. Uh, and so we'll do that here for about 10 minutes. Um, this is a primer on uh, what we call virtual elevation testing. Uh, and I want to do it as an introduction. It can get very involved with the math and all that stuff, but I, I think that it uh, will be pretty interesting to just give a real overview of how you can use an, uh, a power meter on the road to actually measure aerodynamics. So let's talk a little bit about uh, what you're measuring. Uh, you know, power measure, a power meter measures the amount of force that the rider is putting into the pedals. But resisting that force is all the forces that are resisting the motion of the bicycle. And so if you can flip that around and realize that the, the power meter is, you know, you got all this physiology on one side of the power meter, well you got all this physics on the other side of the power meter. And uh, the power meter is measuring both of those things. Um, so we can calculate all the resistive forces on the bicycle, but then we can boil this down to a couple key things that we really want to know about. And one is what's the CDA, or the coefficient of drag, uh, of the bicycle? What's the aerodynamic drag of the bicycle and rider and wheels all together? And that boils down to the CDA number um, that we'll talk about. That's a very important thing uh, that these guys chase all day and, and all night. Um, and then the other thing uh, is uh, rolling, rolling resistance, your coefficient of rolling resistance. How much uh, energy is it taking to roll the tires down the road also? Now we can work this all out and uh, you know you can make this as complicated as you want. I broke it up. When the power on your bike, it's really kind of overcoming four major things. And one is your aerodynamic drag, 
Uh, another thing is rolling resistance, just like we talked about those two things. Another thing is hills. You can ride up the hill, it takes, takes power and energy to do that. And then finally, if you change the speed of the bike, it takes power to, to actually accelerate the mass of the bike and rider forward. Now, looking at what composes each of those things, in the aerodynamic drag, the CDA is very important. Also, the wind, uh, the speed that you're traveling at, and the density of the air that you're traveling through. Uh, rolling resistance, you've got this, uh, your coefficient of rolling resistance, CRR, speed, and then, of course, your mass and gravity uh, are important there. Ride a bike on the moon, you get less rolling resistance because there's less force between the tire and the surface of the, of, of the moon. Um, and then, of course, hills, you've got the road inclines important, your speed, mass, and gravity. And then acceleration, uh, the speed, your change in speed, or your actual acceleration here, and then the mass uh, are what drives the, the power there. Now, if we uh, find a, one of the classic ways of measuring this, I'll just hop back. Uh, I color coded these because power we can measure with the power meter. Speed we can measure with a speed sensor. Mass we can weigh ahead of the, of the ride by weighing the bike and rider together. And the gravity and air density, air density we can look up for the day, and uh, gravity we know because it's usually the same. Um, usually. It actually varies by over 1% over the surface of the Earth. You know that? <laughs> Not kidding. You know, there's a lot of things that go into it. It's interesting. Um, anyway, but then what we don't know is our aerodynamic drag, the wind, uh, our rolling resistance, and the incline of the road. So the classic way to go out and do the test was actually to just find a perfectly flat section of road and go ride down it at a fixed speed and measure how much power you're taking. And then you go step through this at different speeds. So you just ride at 10 miles an hour, uh, 12 miles an hour, step it up through some different speeds, and you probably go back and forth, go both directions and all that um, to try to minimize the wind and all those things. Uh, you can do a good job of it. It works. You know, you do it in a long hallway or a uh, stadium. It can be better because you have less wind and it's more flat and all that. But if you're doing it on the road, you really find very quickly that you really want very, very low wind. You also want uh, very little hill. Um, you always have speed and power are changing up and down a bit, bit as you ride, and small hills make a big difference. I did some of this testing with a solar-powered car, and we found it was, in Indiana, it was the straightest, flattest section of road. And when you went and did it, and you worked it out, and you kind of worked some things backwards, and it was like, wow, that was downhill at half a percent, and then it was 1.1% up, and then another half percent down. And it was really obvious in the data when you go back. So even when you get out and you think that road is flat, it's not. And uh, when you start doing careful testing, you'll definitely see that. Um, so it, it really limits the uh, test locations that you, can, that you can use to do this sort of testing. So is there a way that we can do this a little better? Well, it turns out there is. And that's what we call this virtual elevation testing, or, or AKA the Chung method. And you have to ask, is Robert Chung in the audience? OK, I've never met him, so. He wrote, a, he wrote a paper about this and put it on the internet. I, you know, it's been developed in multiple ways, but in the cycling world, the Chung method is virtual elevation, and uh, I'll give you the reference at the end. But uh, here's the little trick. Uh, if you ride in a, uh, in a closed loop, and you ride around this loop, and it's up and down and whatever, you know, measuring that flat road in Indiana, it was, like, it was hard to tell if this thing was up or down or not. But if you ride in a loop, you do get one piece of information, and that's what when you get back to the start of the loop, you know, you go around and you come back wherever you're at, you are now at the same elevation you knew you were when you started. And that's like a critical little bit because all of a sudden you can anchor something in. If you ride a lap and you go up and down and around and come back, when you're back, you're at where you started. So that gives you, you don't know exactly what the elevation did throughout the lap, but you know when you're done, you're the same. And that's new information that you can utilize uh, in the testing. And so what you do is you go find a loop uh, with hills uh, in it. It helps. Very, very low traffic. Hills you can, you can do with or without, but they usually help because they get you at riding at different speeds. Um, and uh, make sure it doesn't require any brakes. I left that off the other places power goes, but hitting the brakes, yeah, power goes into the brakes. So don't touch the brakes when you're doing this stuff. And then uh, when you ride around the loop, you use a power meter and a speed sensor. And again, we're going to go back. We've got these four unknowns. And what we can do for a, a method of solving is you can actually just guess at this stuff. And so you guess at what your rolling resistance was, what your aerodynamic drag was. The wind is kind of a questionable one. You know, low wind still really helps here. 
Um, and then instead of guessing at the road climb, incline, you can calculate it. And uh, I'll just hop through this real quickly, but basically if you go back the other direction, the amount of power you spent on the hills is your total power minus the other stuff. And the other stuff you can actually calculate out because you made some educated guesses and took your measurements. And what you get is a, a plot like this. And so the, the first graph up there, you can, this is a plot of elevation versus time over across about seven laps. And it's going uphill. Well, we know this is wrong because we know at the end of every lap we actually came back to the same spot. And so if you guess wrong on your aerodynamic drag and rolling resistance, in this case, your aerodynamic drag guess was too low, you're saying, oh, I, I must have been super aero, it was super efficient moving through the air. Well, if that was true, and you go with the speed that you measured and all that stuff, when you come back, it's like, well, you were blowing 300 watts, you must have been going up with one heck of a hill. And that's what this graph is telling you. And then what you can do is go back, and you can adjust your guesses at aerodynamic drag and the rolling resistance, and get something like this. And of course, here, you've got these four laps, where the elevations are about the same at the top of each lap. And then you know that the CDA, in this case 0.375, is about right for what this rider had in these laps. And of course, I picked this, this is a uh, graph from uh, Robert Chung's paper. It's kind of nice because it demonstrates some of the, the difficulty in doing this. In this case, the rider, I believe, was changing position throughout the ride. And so you have these laps with this aerodynamic drag, and then they got less air at the end uh, and had about 0.4 of CDA for the last few laps. And you can see that change, you can see that come out of the, the data and the laps are what help you do that. Just to uh, run through a few other examples, uh, Montreal World Cup race, I forget what year this was, but you can see here uh, CDF 0.25 turned out uh, to be a little high, but 0.23 really makes all these other laps fit. Um, and I think that's uh, kilometers at the end. So you know that's 100 kilometers worth of data. And you can see that at that 0.23, that's really making the laps come out about right. It really helps you figure out what they were at there. And of course, uh, if the CDA was too, too low, then again, it starts to look like you were going uphill. I've got a couple kind of, these are a little extra special pieces of data from uh, uh, Alpha Mantis Technologies. It's a new uh, group of guys working on this stuff up in Canada. And they've got a really fancy uh, solver system so that you don't even have to guess at the initial uh, uh, conditions for these things. You pipe in your data, you tell it your laps, and then it will solve for you. Uh, and it's pretty neat because you can actually use the power meter to become a really, really fancy scale. If you happen to know your aerodynamic drag and your rolling resistance, you can have it tell you how much your bike and rider weigh. Okay? <laughs> And it, and it will do that, because if you happen to know one thing, it can back calculate the others. So this is a road ride, uh, and then this is a, actually a track ride. You can't see the scale here. This one, they did some fancy stuff where they added some more corrections for centripetal acceleration and the change in CG height as you go around the track. But what you see here, in between all those runs, the change in elevation there is like within five centimeters. It's really, really narrow. Uh, and you can, with the good data and a controlled uh, environment, you can really nail down what you're doing and uh, have a good idea of, of the measurement of, uh, of your aerodynamic drag and make all the math work out. Again, why does this help? Um, the laps really help because you're adding more information uh, to the system. You're kind of giving the sum of this integral over, over the lap, and that helps you uh, do the math better to, to uh, figure out what your drags and resistive forces really work. At the end, uh, you, you can't do any braking during your laps, uh, and changing position during the test, of course, changes your drag, so that's uh, a, uh, a problem you need to watch out for and make sure that you're actually compare, uh, knowing what you're testing for. If you're wiggling around and looking all over, you're, you're not getting a good measurement of your dynamic drag. And then finally, the wind. Uh, and uh, the little bit there is that Alpha Mantis, the place that uh, did the nice solver, they're working on a very, very good uh, aerodynamic sensor uh, that you can ride with to actually get very, very good wind data live as you're going, uh, which will again help do this aerodynamic testing. Uh, finally, a few resources for this. Uh, the best one is this uh, Robert Chung's uh, free paper on uh, estimating CAD CDA with a power meter. Uh, also, if you look in the Golden Cheetah program, they have a section in there called AeroLab, 
uh, that will help you to, uh, to do some of this analysis. You don't have to do all the math uh, yourself if you don't happen to be a, an Excel ninja. And then, of course, Alpha Mantis Technologies is working on some of these things all together. So that's uh, everything that I've got, and I think we'll rotate over to questions. Jim, thank you very much. Gentlemen, thank you.